Hi, and welcome to Take Every Thought Captive, our weekly look at the Catholic intellectual tradition and an exploration of the author's books and topics that have shaped Catholic thinking for 2,000 years. My name is Jason Gale. I'm joined this week by Dr. Benjamin Smith, our lecturer in philosophy at Catholic Studies Academy. Before we get started today, I want to invite all, invite all our listeners to uh, like us on Facebook, share any of our content that you think uh, may be beneficial to the people you love and know, uh, especially with regards to uh, learning more, not just about their Catholic faith, but also about uh, philosophy from a uh, Catholic point of view. Uh, and why that's so important today is one of the, one of the topics we're going to <laughs> uh, uh, we're going to look into and cover. And uh, this may be one of those episodes that you say, okay, this can be helpful for a lot of my friends and people, especially right now. <laughs> uh, and that's because our topic today is going to be Marxism. And uh, it's, it's seen a resurgence and not just, uh, um, you know, uh, popular culture, but, but also in, in politics and mm -hmm. in many different areas where uh, we have to uh, take it seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we have to be able to uh, not just say communism sucks, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, fall into, you know, a bunch of communist memes and things like that. <laughs> but, uh, as funny as they are, right. as, as appropriate as many of them are, you know, as well. Uh, it's important for us to be able to, uh, to look at, to discuss with, uh, with some clarity, um, Marx's position and uh, kind of, uh, use that to to look at the lens of today uh, mm -hmm. and see kind of what uh, what people are thinking, what people are doing, and uh, you know uh, be able to make a judgment about what we see today based on uh, what we know about this or that. Um, so, Dr. Smith, to get us started today, um, can you kind of just maybe uh, uh, broaden that a little bit? You know, why sure. why is it important to to study Marx? Because I mean, we yeah. can we can take that position that. Mark sucks. Let's move on. <laughs> but that does sure, nothing sure. for conversation. You know, sure, it does sure. great in echo chambers. But... <laughs> That's right. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, having, um, you know, uh, grown up and, and, and seen the, the Berlin Wall fall, I, you know, I'm old enough to remember seeing that happen yeah. on the news. And uh, it, 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 the resurgence of Marxism to me is, is rather remarkable. I thought if there was anything that we had just sort of moved beyond, uh, it would it would be uh, Marxism, you know, but history is full of surprises, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things you have to kind of think about is, you know, uh, why is it attractive to a lot of people today? And yeah. I think one, one thing you need to say is, well, maybe there are some real insights there. Maybe there's something to it, uh, you know. And I, I think in studying the history of philosophy, as I have for a long time, one of the things I've tried to do is, is, is try to learn how to think like the people I'm studying yeah. and, and, and see like, you know, with any of the philosophers who have been deeply influential, they almost all have some good insights, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise they wouldn't be studied forever. Right. right. <laughs> you know? So I think one of the things that if you're going to really understand a, a way of thought is that you need to, to try to get into the inside of it, which includes uh, uh, understanding what real insights um, that philosopher has to offer. So I think it's 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 worth studying for those the, for that point, but also I think you know, and then you know, more importantly, uh, in some ways, despite the real insights that Marx has, um, I think you know, we also need to be made very aware of the the grave errors. I think one of the things that we might we might have some sense of what's wrong with Marxism, you know, it's obvious totalitarianism. Right. It's, you know, um, you know, sort of extremely bloody history, um, those sorts of things, you know, it's antipathy to human freedom, et cetera. Um, but, uh, at the same time, you know, there might be kind of deeper errors that, that, that are kind of more kind of subterranean, right. And yeah. more for foundational and, and getting to understand those will actually help us to have a, a, a better, uh, sort of perspective on what Marxism is and why it's wrong and, and how we can avoid maybe even accidentally adopting some of the presuppositions of Marxism. Yeah. Yeah. And to be able to uh, go at the roots of it, not just, mm -hmm. you know, looking at symptoms or trying to address right, right. things that are on, you know, th you know, results from, you know, or conclusions from premises, but look at the mm -hmm. premises themselves. Right. You know, and, and just point of clarification, when Dr. Smith says, he, you know, to go inside, 
you know, a, a, a thinker or something like that. He doesn't mean go join a Marxist movement. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> Bad move. Gone too far. Too far. I mean, in, in the world of ideas. <laughs> That's right. In the world. <laughs> awesome. All right. All right. So where do we begin with Marx? Where do, where, where do we begin by looking at mm-hmm. uh, uh, his point of view? Well, I think, you know, uh, most everyone, I think at some point, uh, well, who knows now, but at some point in your education will have read, I think, the Communist Manifesto, yeah, uh, which is uh, actually in some ways, I think, a, a fine summary of uh, some of the important points of uh, Marxism. Uh, that said, it is a manifesto, right? And it's it's written to be you know, sort of polemical and very explicit and kind of a call to action. Mm-hmm. And, and that's not kind of, it is meant it is. to be a call yeah. to action, right? Um, and so I, I think it's a fine place to to, to begin reading. Um, uh, I think the theses of Feuerbach are probably even a better place to begin. But I think, you know, there, you're really only going to be scratching the surface if all you've ever read is the Communist Manifesto. Mm. What you really need to do is, is kind of look some at the philosophical context uh, the broader philosophical context in which Karl Marx was working. Yeah. Um, so it, it takes a little bit of work to do this, a little bit of patience, but uh, it's worthwhile in terms of really understanding. You know, Marx didn't come up with his theories about you know communism and uh, the exploitation of labor and all that sort of thing within a philosophical vacuum. He's operating within a specific you know uh, point in the history of philosophy, uh, and you know like any thinker, right? He's very influenced by, you know, the the great thinkers of his own time and place. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, Karl Marx is a German, right? <laughs> and, you know, he's, he's a German German philosopher and, and you know, working within um, that context, right? Marxism emerges really as kind of one of the last stages of what you kind of maybe call the grand you know, history of early, uh, of modern German philosophy, yeah. stretching from Kant really to Hegel. It is fascinating when you think about German philosophy, how profoundly uh, influential it, it's been. I mean, I would say really up through Heidegger and Gadamer, yeah. German philosophy is really the leading kind of philosophy in terms of, you know, contemporary work, you know, at the various times. Um, you know, French existentialism has its day, but really that's just a spinoff, right? Of German existential, of German philosophy. Yeah. So uh, I think you need to understand some things about, about German philosophy at the time, which means understanding some things about Kant and Hegel. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, I, I don't, we've, we've talked about Immanuel Kant a good bit, so I don't want to belabor it too much. If you could go back, maybe Jason, you could put in some the show notes, some episodes where we've talked about Kant yeah, uh, sure. in the past. Um, the, the basic, you know, ba- Kant's basic contribution, so to speak, uh, um, in, t- in German philosophy is he really is the first one to, to, to bring in the idea of construction and projection. Mm-hmm. That is, he, he articulates a view, and there's complicated reasons why he does this, but he articulates a view in which he says, the objects of experience are not sort of impressed upon us, right? From things outside of us, rather the objects of experience, our experience. So, you know, li- hearing me now yeah. or uh, turning, you know, driving your car. That's what I mean by objects of experience. Those objects of experience, those aspects of experience, moments of experience are a synthesis, right? of external reality and internal categories and ideas, right? So it's a projection really kind of of ourselves, right? As much as something coming from the outside. Our common sense perspective is I see a tree because there's a tree there (laughs) and and the tree, you know, somehow the, the, the image of the tree is impressed upon the kind of sense powers I have, right? Whereas what, what Kant wants to say is, well, kind of, right? <laughs> right? It's really more that your seeing of the tree is a synthesis of kind of the a priori innate categories you already have and the thing sort of interacting, right? So you never really know the, tr- the thing in itself. So, you just know it as it's perceived by a knowing thing like you. Now, I want to ha- just add very quickly, 
Kant is not a relativist about this or a radical subjectivist. He thinks that we all have the same categories, okay? Later philosophers are going to make those moves, okay, Mm -hmm. where you go from it's a projection to it's an entirely individual subjective projection. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and you would people encounter that today, I think, a lot. You mm -hmm, know, like if mm -hmm. uh, um, I used to... uh, live with a, a, a one of my buddies was a philosopher uh, i'm sorry a psychology student mm-hmm. and i mean his professor whatever went through this whole thing on how religion was just the projection of right, our right. inability to explain all things we needed we needed an explanation so much right. that we just projected it right, entire right. religions uh, sure. uh, onto onto the world and society mm-hmm. and and kind of set the i mean it was just yeah the, the whole idea of uh, of projection there um yeah, yeah, yeah. you'll find it so all a, over the place well, yeah it's a major theme there so another way of putting it is you know it's constructed right the right, experience right. is constructed Social, in part. Yeah, yeah. um so the other great theme in kant's philosophy has to do with ethics and that is his view that the ultimate criteria of ethics is autonomy mm-hmm. uh that's very important because other philosophers have thought that freedom is very important. Uh, philosophers like John Locke or Thomas Aquinas, et cetera. But it's one thing to think it's important. It's another thing to think that it, it itself is the criterion of, uh, of what's good and what should be done, right? Yeah. So, you know, in a classical view, self-governance or freedom involves your, freely, uh, your free pursuit, right? of various goods right the but good. the goods yeah. are de- yeah are defined uh uh prior to your freedom yeah for kant the good is defined by freedom yeah and so uh what that ends up meaning is a really heavy emphasis on uh autonomy right and freedom as the real heart of ethics okay yeah. so those are the two things you want to think about when you think about kant one is experience is at least in part a projection of ourselves Mm -hmm. right uh rather than an rather than um uh an insight into reality uh and uh, as it is in itself and then secondly that autonomy is the foundation of uh, morality and ethics so those uh, those two points make sense jason yeah 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 and i think we could see examples of of still how today Mm-hmm. the the kind of popular thinking is is so much influenced by uh, right. Kant whether it be sure. whether it be you know the elevating of autonomy to essentially the definition of freedom and mm-hmm. you know and removing and, and I think that's a, a key step for morality was the removal of kind of the good mm-hmm. from from uh, freedom and mm-hmm. therefore ethics um, right, that right, this right. this idea that the good is is something that is uh, there before. Uh, our freedom mm-hmm. is that's right um, right you right. know so i mean you could you could see i think there's tons of examples that we can that we could look at that that mm-hmm. really point to uh kant's continued influence sure uh, today. yeah no doubt so those themes were uh developed even more radically by later philosophers in germany uh, a group of philosophers sometimes called the absolute idealist mm-hmm. uh so they they just take the theses further and take it you know, in a direction where ultimately they end up saying that there is no thing in itself, yeah. right? Um, that all of reality is just a projection of human thinking. Uh, <laughs> again, they're not relativists in the sense that they think there's one mind or there's one set of categories. So it's not as if you have your reality and I have mine. We all, we humans have a reality and it's because of the way our minds are structured basically, right? Um, so it's not just like your reality and my reality, it's our reality as human beings, right? Yeah, uh-huh. and it leads to just kind of chopping off an entire branch of philosophy called metaphysics, <laughs> right? You know, like sure, it, sure. It, it really, you know, and I think that's why uh, many, you know, in the church uh, have called for, look, we need to, you know, double down our efforts on mm-hmm. kind of not not reclaiming because we because you know we've always had a strong uh, uh, metaphysical tradition, but to mm-hmm. we need to we need to redouble our efforts to study it. <laughs> right, um, sure. because it is so much more denied today yeah right 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 yeah and the, and the, and the absolute idealist had a had a role to play in that um one of the things that was part of the absolute idealist view is that you know some of them had emphasized this to more or less of a degree but um think about philosophers like um 
uh, Fichte and Schelling was the idea that really there's a kind of almost universal human spirit mm. uh, or a universal human mind uh, that, you know, that really it's, calling it human is, is not quite right. It's more that there is mind and humans are kind of a projection and extension of mind. Yeah. If that makes sense. Right. So mind is the fundamental reality for them and everything else is defined in, in its terms. Right. So it's a, it's a fascinating way to think about the world, but um, this, this um, uh, approach finds its fullest expression, I think, in the work of um, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. <laughs> so, what a beautiful name! But I'll just say that right now. That name. If you've ever seen, if you've ever seen pictures of Marx or Engels, like the beards that these guys the beards, were able. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. ama- It's it's very impressive. Uh, so I'll give them that. They have wonderful names, <laughs> wonderful name. sounding names, and uh, great beards. <laughs> great beards. That's so uh, Hegel is basically, you know, an absolute idealist. Uh, but he, he adds some really interesting components or brings out some components uh, with a lot of force. And Engels, who was the Marx's kind of uh, the kind of friend and really sort of um, underwrote a lot of the, his expenses and, and <laughs> kind of a creative partner. Yeah. Um, uh, Engels said that, that Hegel was the most important philosopher for Karl Marx, source yeah. for Karl Marx. And, and Hegel brings a couple of things to the table here. One is uh, he, he agrees with all of the absolute idealists that the knowing subject, that is that the mind, the mind is the number one thing. And that it's the thing that we need to study in order not only to understand mind, but in order to understand reality. Because reality is a projection of mind, in order to understand my, uh, reality, we, we need to understand mind. Right. Yeah. Uh, does that does that make sense? Yeah, that follows. Yeah. Okay. Right. If that's so, going to be your yeah, if that's going to be your starting point, then yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah, you can see that the where, because uh, this was you know this was also the time when you also had the the psychology, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Um, probably expanding during this time. Well, yeah, it's a little a little before that, but not about too much. Yeah. Yeah. May or just maybe a precursor to mm-hmm. you know the 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 influence of psychology. Yeah. Uh, sure. You know, the uh, um, so Hegel, Hegel's view of the thinking subject, right, is what he calls Geist, right? Mm-hmm. Geist can be uh, translated a number of ways. It's usually translated as spirit, right? That's, I think that's okay, uh, but you shouldn't be thinking of anything like a soul. It's more a, just a reality, the reality of understanding, the reality of mind. But the, what's important that's added to Geist there with, by, the, by the term Geist is development. So it's mm. my, I, I would, dynamic understanding. Right? <laughs> D- now, now is, it, is it something we share? Is this, this Geist yeah. something we all mm-hmm. share in together? Or do we each have our own little, little Geist? I, I would say there's Geist. And, <laughs> and, and you, have, you, are, you are an expression of Geist. Yeah. You are part of Geist, but Geist is bigger than you. Yeah. Okay. Right. So again, it's kind of the spirit of humanity. We get that language, the spirit of humanity from Hegel, right? That, that's okay. where that stuff comes from, right? So it's kind of like, you know, the human spirit striving, right? When we use those kinds of language, usually we mean it kind of metaphorically or something, but sure. You know, Hegel's like, that's ah, actually not a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's reality, it's right? Reality, uh, yeah. The, you know, um, so Geist is deeper than any individual human, but each individual human is, uh, kind of a manifestation of Geist, right? Of, yeah. of dynamic understanding or striving understanding. And what Hegel sort of thinks, there's two important aspects here that Hegel brings out. One is that Geist changes. That's absolutely mm. uh, shocking in the history of philosophy. Yeah. Uh, Kant, Schelling, Fichte, all these later guys, Spinoza, whatever, none of them would have thought that, that was the case. Aristotle, all... all almost all philosophers believed, right, that once you got human nature, you got it, right? That is, yeah. it, it doesn't change, right? This goes deep into the history of philosophy that what we're trying to get at are universal and permanent truths. Um, and what Hegel uh, posits is, nope, <laughs> right? Geist changes. Human nature itself changes, right? Uh, which is, is, is really pretty radical. 
And the way he, he thinks about that is to say, well, um, uh, if we look at the history of Geist, mm. what we find is that Geist radically changes. And he has this whole, if anybody, you know, if you ever really want to <laughs> get time off in purgatory, uh, dedicate your reading of the phenomenology of spirit to the expiation of your sins. Uh, because <laughs> it will do it for you. <laughs> you know, it's a, uh, it is a very dense, it's 700, it's over 700 pages. Good night, uh, man. Ex- yeah, I know. Extremely <laughs> dense, um, work, very difficult to read. Um, but it has its points. And, uh, what he does in there is he, he traces the idea of, of, it's gonna be hard to say, human self-consciousness. Mm. Mm-hmm. through different historical epochs. Yeah. Right? So the way in which humans have conceived of themselves in the Persian Empire, in um, classical Greek city-states, in the Roman Empire, in medieval Europe, in Reformation Europe, etc. right? And in each of these, he kind of delineates a kind of a whole conceptual scheme about self-understanding that's radically different in each stage of development. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, so so to look at, at, at history that way, what is, if we take kind of that view of history, then what does the future look like? Mm. Con- uh, Hegel knows, actually. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, even, yeah. <laughs> even though Hegel thinks that Geist changes, right, mm-hmm. that self-understanding changes, it's cha- we can, through the study of history, find that it's changing in one direction. Yeah, where's it going? Uh, It's going towards uh, the full realization of the freedom of self-consciousness, right? So we're becoming... Sounds sounds fun. Sounds sounds kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, right. And I think if you could say it in German, like, it would sound (laughs) even cooler, right? Uh, But it was the... uh, um, I, I need to learn. I need to learn German just so I can say cool things in German. (laughs) But anyways, the... The... Um, the idea, right, is that that over time we're becoming more and more aware of the freedom of Geist, the autonomy of Geist. That yeah. That's what Geist is, um, and and you know this is a vision of history, and I think to people of his time a, a, a pretty compelling one, right? That is sure. that yeah. really what's going on. I think even to modern folks, uh, there's been a kind of revival of interest in Hegel, not more, not his more sort of kind of frankly, weird metaphysical views, but his views about the philosophy of history yeah. and anthropology, where you say, you know, one could conceptualize history being the progressive fuller realization of human autonomy, right? I like that you use that word there, progressive, you know, because that's, I mean, that, that I, I think that uh, uh, knowing what little I know about Hegel and his view of history and living in our current society i think what sometimes a lot of people say why we uh when they use the term well we need to we need progress we need to do Uh, these things that they they whether they know it or not they have this kind of very hegelian view of Mm -hmm. history that sure we're 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 the idea that we're always progressing to something Mm -hmm. better which is that greater exercise of our freedom you know or something like that yeah 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 no they don't get it you know i think Mm. they do have this when when they use especially when they use the term you know progressive that it's that's something good that's that's right yeah sure that's pro yeah i mean uh, that that's built into the term progress which you know the 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 opposite would be regress or decline right yeah uh you know and uh yeah absolutely that's the, the that is our i would call it you know it's kind of gives you a philosophical underpinning for secular hope, right? Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to Christian hope, right? Yeah. That, you know, that we're, we're just, we're yeah. just heading towards this, you know, utopian egalitarian future that everything's going to, where everything's going to be perfect and no one's going to suffer or cry. And it's going to be, you know, just bliss. Um, the, um, anyway, but, uh, the, uh, it, you're absolutely right about that, that view. Uh, although there are a couple of qualifications I want to throw sure. in there. Uh, one of them has to do with his view of freedom and the second has to do with Mm. um, what Hegel thinks about the role of the mind in all this, right? Because remember, this is mind, this is Geist, right? Um, So I'll start with the the role of the mind because it has to do with history. He says that history then, right, is self-understanding trying to ultimately 
grasp onto its own freedom, right? Or trying to understand itself. And as it tries to understand itself, it realizes more and more that freedom is the meaning of itself. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let me try to say that again. Okay. Geist, right, is dynamic understanding. And what it's trying to do is understand itself. And what it grasps over time is um, its own freedom. Okay. So what that means is since it's trying to understand itself and, and history is a projection of it, yeah. right? That history is really the history of the ideas of Geist, right? Mm. So think about Rome. Rome is an idea, right? Rome is the idea of law, of imperium, of command, of authority, mm -hmm. of hierarchy, right? That's a kind of ideal, right? That that animates kind of Roman civilization to a certain extent, right? Um, th does that make sense? That's the way yeah, Hegel yeah. conceptualizes so, so, it, right? And so for Hegel, that's kind of uh, a, a stage of development mm -hmm. in the 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 geist of the human the human spirit. So maybe mm -hmm. may, you know maybe similar to you know like the stages of human development you know yeah that, sure that sure. psychologist maybe maybe that's a good analogy we can mm -hmm. we can use to understand hegel's absolutely. view of history here yeah yeah, yeah uh, absolutely and, stuff. And, and i think and it, you know looking at it that way you know the way that an adult looks at the the developmental stage of a of a five-year-old mm -hmm. i think that's that's so true today with a lot of the way that people look at Roman mm -hmm. society. Oh, mm -hmm. they, you know, they didn't have the technology that we did. They didn't have this that we did. Mm -hmm. And we see ourselves as so much better, right? <laughs> right. Better than, than the yeah. Romans yeah. or than, you know, medieval uh, yeah. Europe. Sure. Uh, well, well, I will say that Hegel has the view that each of these stages is important and necessary. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and actually thinks that Christianity was important, had an important role to play. Right. 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 Uh, in the development of consciousness. I won't get into that because that's a long conversation, <laughs> but, um, but so it's important to see then that this guy striving to understand itself means that history involves ideas. Uh, history really is the development of certain ideas. Yeah. Um, and so the material conditions of Rome, this is important for understanding Marx later, are determined by the idea of Rome, right? Mm -hmm. It's the idea of Rome that really gives the material conditions. I mean, the material circumstances in which people live, that's what shapes, right? Those material uh, conditions, right? So we still, we, like in the philosophy of history, people tend to either be idealist or materialist. Yeah. Idealists think that ideas and concepts are the most important thing, right? Materialists think germs and steel and material conditions are the most important thing, right? Yeah. And then of course, you know, you could be kind of in between. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so Hegel really focused then on the ideas, mm -hmm. and Marx took it up and brought in kind of the mis materialist conception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, He's gonna history or absolutely. Yeah, he's gonna turn yeah. it on its head uh, um, uh, for sure. Um, the uh, and say that you know Hegel got it exactly. Hegel was right and exactly wrong. <laughs> yeah. He had the right kind of general idea yeah, yeah. about the development of consciousness over time, but he was wrong in terms of what's driving that, yeah. uh, is what yeah, Marx yeah. is going to say. But before I get ahead of myself, one other thing about freedom, and then we'll move on from Hegel, sure. is that Hegel's conception of freedom is not do whatever you want. Uh, Hegel's conception of freedom is, very, is a very Kantian conception of freedom. Mm -hmm. And basically, the, the, that view is that your inclinations, right? So doing what you want means following your desires. Well, your desires, your inclinations that you experience come from outside of your will. They're either biological or they are sociological and political and therefore not something chosen by you. And so to act on those inclinations is in fact not to act in a free way, is to act in a way that's kind of heteronymous or a little bit slavish. Uh, so what you need to do is instead act on your reason alone, right? Yeah. And what that means is to act in a way in which you, you will things from a completely universal and consistent point of view rather than your individual point of view uh, or individual desires or inclinations. So it's a kind of freedom, but yeah. it's a freedom that's, it's, it's not do whatever you want, right? Um, uh, and, and that's important. 
in, in Hegel's view, that reaches its fullness in what he calls objective freedom, which is where we live, and this is again very important, within a social and economic order in which that universal, non-individualistic, non-inclination-based uh, freedom is fully manifested in a social political order. Right. Uh, he now he kind of thought that they were getting close to that in 19th century Germany, yeah, uh, which was fairly authoritarian, actually, uh, which shows you that he does like his conception of freedom isn't about democracy. In fact, he's very clear. He says, look, you know, most democracy and he's probably right about this. Most <laughs> democracies, you know, when people vote, they're just voting on inclinations. They're not voting about what's universally good or universally consistent or yeah, yeah. What, what should be willed for the whole world. They're just voting on their personal, you know, inclinations. And from his point of view, then they're not free. So ironically, right, uh, he would say most democratic elections are not an expression of freedom, uh, but a kind of a servile kind of exercise. Right, right. Uh, so that's important to have in mind, too, because Marx sees himself. So this is it can be very confusing because Marx sees himself as a philosopher of freedom. Right. He thinks that he is advancing human freedom. And yeah. if you're thinking from sort of a classical liberal that is kind of Anglo-American perspective, yeah. when you think of, of freedom as in terms of individual rights and individual liberty, you're like, I had no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. But it's because he has a very different conception of freedom. His conception of freedom is about acting beyond inclination, beyond nature, and beyond history and culture. It's, it's acting in a way in which you act, you will globally, you will universally, right? And consistently. Does that make sense? So you choose, yeah. whenever you choose, you choose for all men. Yeah. Yeah. So it's almost, it's, it's almost like if you want to, if we're, if we're building a picture of the human person that mm -hmm. this, or, or a picture of society, this, this, there's this geist that mm -hmm. we are all kind of participating in. And what Marx wants to do is build the body that will embody <laughs> that geist. Sure, it's and least, yeah. Maybe, mm -hmm. e you know, each of us will have our role to play and we need to understand our role and our freedom as mm -hmm. participating in that uh, that embodiment of the geist. How's that? Right. Yeah, so that, yeah. Is that good? All right, good. good. Pretty good, yeah, good. Um, so, but, but, I, but, I, but I think yeah. that's so important for our listeners, like, like to, uh, uh, to, to look at, to understand a, at least a little bit about Hegel and Kant. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and to understand kind of the the context then sure. uh, that sets up, you know, 19th Marx, century yeah, German yeah. Karl Marx. <laughs> yeah, so we think about Karl Marx, right? So he, again, he's working in Germany uh, as a young man. Eventually he does most of his mature work in England, in England um, yeah. because he has to flee uh, yeah. Germany because not surprisingly, the Kaiser isn't a big fan. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, uh, but anyways, um, the... It's interesting here. So um, Marx is a young man, and he, he, he's very explicit about this, was a Hegelian. Like he, you know, as a, as a young man, he was schooled in Hegelianism. Hegel was almost close to like an official philosopher, right, yeah. uh, for Germany, right? He was kind of almost like the state philosopher. Yeah, uh, and, Mark, and Marx learned from one of Hegel's own students. That's right, yeah, yeah. So, you know, he's, uh, he's very much working from this. But a number of other of, of people like him began to really turn Hegel upside down. This is really a, uh, an age where you start moving in a materialist direction. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, you know, idealism is one extreme, right, in philosophy. Uh, and then what we end up doing is moving towards another extreme in philosophy, yep. which is uh, materialism. Uh, you can see this, of course, very much in the work of, say, Charles Darwin, uh, folks like that. Um, but uh, what Marx does here is he he thinks that that Hegel is correct that human consciousness um, is changing over time. Uh, and uh, he thinks that that those historical conditions are important, right? He also thinks that freedom is what's most important um in thinking ethically um but what he thinks is is that hegel's got it exactly opposite mm -hmm. of, of what the truth is there's no geist there's no it's not it's mind isn't reality what reality is is matter yeah 
it's matter in motion to steal a phrase from Hobbes. Uh, it's, it's material things. Uh, and what we are, are basically strange phrase, material spirits. Uh, we do have some sort of freedom that's part of our uh, sort of makeup, but uh, and part of our experience, part of the human condition, but we are material and everything that's real is material without remainder. Hmm. What this means for, for um, Marx then is that um, to understand human consciousness and to understand human history, we need to understand the material conditions. Does that right. make sense, right? Yeah. So you're kind of flipping everything exactly on its head. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> yeah, like the, the, the kind of driving force of idealism, Marx was like, all right, they got it, but they remain focused on the mind. You know, That's what, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Matter really, is what really matters, you know? That's yeah. right, yeah, matter is what matters. Uh, and so a couple, a couple of points here about his anthropology. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and sort of this new understanding then of human consciousness, right? So again, it, it's so interesting, even though he's materialist, he then th still thinks, okay, but what we really still need to understand is human condition, but we're gonna understand the human condition in sort of conversation with the larger material context, right? Yeah. So the, the, the human condition here, if we look at it, right, there's a couple of things that, that kind of come to the fore. One is, and this is kind of a Hegelian view, um, is that um, Marx comes to think that human nature, human essence, has basically been a complete misguided notion for almost all of the history of philosophy <laughs> almost everybody's gotten it wrong hegel got the closest to getting it right but uh the really what human essence is this is so fascinating so important for people to understand this yeah what human essence is is it's simply the ensemble of social relations again and nothing more that is yeah. what it means to be a human your humanity is entirely defined by the social relations in which you operate. Now think about how important that is in our present day. We don't have to go into a, a ton of detail here, but if you yeah. think about sort of like uh, the identity politics that we, we, we experience, you think about um, the sort of angst that certain groups feel, one of the things that's, that's evident there, right, is a view of the self and of, the, of nature, of human nature, that is entirely defined by social relationship, right? Yeah. Think about how different this is than say um, a Stoic or a Christian perspective, right? Where, you know, within a Christian perspective, St. Paul teaches us that, you know, we can be imprisoned and in bonds and rejoicing, right? Yeah. Why is that? Because we're made in the image of God and meant for eternal, you know, joy with him. So even if I'm imprisoned and in bonds, I, that's not my identity. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But from, from, from Karl Marx's perspective, that's completely wrong and deceptive, right? All you are is your, the ensemble of your social relations. That has to do with the fact, right, uh, that your social relations are what primarily determines the material characteristics of your existence and your experience, right? So you see how this all kind of fits together? Yeah, social absolutely. Material conditions, the social relations define you because the the social relations have to, are really the expression of they're the deepest and most profound expression of the material conditions in which you operate right yeah so to translate that uh, you are <laughs> you are defined by the groups you belong to you <laughs> That's know, right. by the groups you are activists for you know like it's <laughs> right, right so you know um, um, you're not, you know, you're not a rational animal that engages in various uh, activities, right? Yeah. You are, um, let's say that you were, um, you know, a, a um, an aristocrat in ancient Athens, right? Well, you're you are defined as what you are, right? Yeah. Is uh, a slave owner and a citizen and um, an oppressor of various groups. I mean, that's all, you, that's what you are, right? Yeah. You're not, not an underlying subject that has those qualities. You just are that, right? Um, yeah. 
and, and so that, I think it's, it's just really important to understand that, that that's the, the heart, like kind of at the root of uh, Marxist anthropology. And, and one thing I will, will say about it, you know, it is a, it, like most errors, it's a, it, it trades on something that is um, a half truth, right? right? That corrupts it. We are social animals, <laughs> right? I, I think that that's important, right? I mean, I think if you've listened to any of our podcast on the common good or any of those sorts of things, you know, like, you'll see that right in the heart of classical political thought is the view that we're social animals, that we're political animals, and that that, that is uh, deeply significant in terms of our opportunities for ver exercising virtue, et cetera, right? So, you know, he's kind of half right and then totally wrong. Yeah. <laughs> because what he was it's one thing to say we're rational animals and as such right we are social um it's another thing to say you are your social relations and that's it <laughs> yeah see? yeah 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 did he have did did marx have any room for the individual or any sort of idea or was that just strictly what he was trying to push against was like kind of an idea of uh -huh. individualism did he have any? I mean, I mean, he, if you had asked him, are there individual things? He would say, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it, you know, like he wasn't. I mean, he didn't think you were like you know. He thought your body was different than my body. You know that kind of thing. Uh, but in terms of your identity, your definition, yeah, 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 yeah. that's social. Yeah. Um, wow. And 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 again, without remainder, um, that's the you know that's 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 the the kind of root of our that's how we receive material conditions and that's how we develop. And again, there's a, there's a, there's a kernel of truth in it, right? That yeah. we do develop together. Right. Yeah. Um, it's We're just born into thing. a family. That's a social relationship. That's right. You, are, you yeah. come into existence through a social relationship. That's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, there's a kernel of truth to it, but at sure. the same time, you like, that that kernel of truth ends up engulfing and eating everything else. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And, right. and I think it's important for our listeners, if you're studying any sort of like ism, mm -hmm. especially one that came out of, you know, 17th century and upwards, <laughs> look at look at the anthropology of, of mm -hmm. kind of what that ism uh, mm -hmm. espouses. Because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you you can really, really begin to 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 see how many of the isms are uh, anti-christian sure. um based on just their anthropology mm -hmm. not even mm -hmm. going on further than that mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but but looking at the, the the anthropology of so many of these are just so important to, to try to grasp to some degree you know yeah 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 so i know we're going kind of a little bit long here we got about a sure. uh, few, few more minutes to go yeah yeah okay yeah. so um so once we accept this right once we recognize that that social relations are the primary expression of our material conditions. Mm -hmm. Sorry to use so much jargon, but you can't talk Marxism without using jargon. <laughs> so um, the, um, once you've accepted this, then what you, what you come to realize is that man's social development mm -hmm. only occurs insofar as he can be productive. Right. Yeah. So uh, productivity uh, this sounds odd, right? Because of our, some of our impressions of communism, but but actually being productive and active is considered the highest form of uh, human freedom here, right? Um, it is our expression, right, of um, of freedom, right? Yeah, uh, is to make things, um, and I think you can again recognize that there's a truth. Yeah. Here, right. That that you know, art, and I don't mean just fine art. I just mean productive skills and processes is part of humanity, right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, I think there's there, and there's something noble and and edifying about man as a maker, as a producer, as somebody who's creative, right? Um, there's a certain pride we take in our uh, production of things, right? Uh -huh. um, Absolutely. Yeah. And and rightly so, you know. And so again, there's something correct here, as 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 with social relations, but you know, at the same time, there's something incorrect, right? And 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 that is the contemplative aspect of the human being. Mm -hmm. uh, Marx has zero time for, right? <laughs> he basically considers, he even says, truth without action is no truth at all, right? 
uh, you know, it, it just doesn't accept that, um, that, that there is any kind of perfection or actualization of the human person outside of productivity, right? Uh, so he he's very sa- says very clearly, I, ri- written, I have this written down, that um, um, our perfection is found in productivity, not receptivity. And he recognizes that receptivity has been a view, right? Uh, of human perfection, right? That is that Absolutely. we receive yeah. from God something or that we receive even at a, just a philosophical level, right? Uh, our contemplation, or something. Yeah, 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 you know, of, of philosophical truths is receptive. What's happening is the world is coming into us, so to speak, yeah. right? You know, we're coming to understand the world and to absorb its form and that sort of thing. You know, Marx thinks that's nonsense. Um, the, uh, what we do is we live within a social context in which we have, um, uh, social relationships and our value within that social context is based on our productivity, uh, not our receptivity. Um, yeah. The first thing that comes to mind is, uh, you know, the little sign above Auschwitz work, makes it free. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that is a German belief, man. I mean, that is written yeah. into 19th century German philosophy. Um, I mean, absolutely, right? Because, you know, well, that whole, I'm sorry. To, go ahead, Jason, go ahead. Well, well I was going to say, you know, and, and again, you know, there, there is, you know, there is an understanding of work as, you know, an extension of, you know, who you sure. are and, you know, maybe, you know, even an exercise of your freedom. Mm-hmm. But what the, you know, but what, again, German philosophy means, mean by you know work makes you free that's different <laughs> yeah, right, especially right. for mark you know that yeah. phrase for marx for, is mm-hmm. is completely different than you know mm-hmm. even mm-hmm. A, a some some sentiment of that within christianity mm-hmm. right but definitely right. not in those words not in those words yeah right um so just wrapping up here um i hope these anthropological points are, are pretty clear yeah just to keep them in mind these are basic baseline theses of marxism one is that your essence and definition is entirely determined by your social relations uh, without remainder. And second, that um, your, your freedom is primarily exercised in your productivity. Uh, and, and that's what gives you value within society. Um, one, one last kind of third point I want to just put out there and then we'll develop it more next time. Sure. But is this is a new understanding then of history based on these two ideas. Uh, so Marx kind of agrees with Hegel about the idea of progress. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe surprisingly to a lot of people, he actually thinks that capitalism was a necessary stage yeah. Yeah, yeah. in the development of history and of humanity. He thinks it's a stage that needs to be uh, overcome and transcended, right? right, right, right. <laughs> right? But, it's, but it is a necessary stage, he thinks, right? Yeah, in fact, absolutely. he thinks it's an advance over uh, basically what he calls feudalism and tradition. Um, so the, um, uh, what he thinks is that history is the unfolding of man realizing his freedom in productivity and social relations, right? That and that's really the terminology he uses, right? So I'll say it again, that history yeah. is the gradual realization of man realizing his freedom in his productivity and social relations, right? So what becomes critical, if that's true, yeah. okay, is, let me ask you this. Jason, if I tell you, go build a table, or I say, well, you know, if you come to me and say, man, I'm really looking forward to building a table. I think it's a great idea. You know, I really have some neat ideas about tables and blah, 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 right? Yeah. And I say, that's great. And and, and then you say, well, you know, I, I need some tools, right? And I say, oh, yeah, you do. Can't have any of mine, <laughs> right? Yeah. And you don't have the tools? Are you going to be able to make your table? No, not a good one. <laughs> right? And, <laughs> yeah, right? So what Marx is going to say here is, think about this now. Let's say that I'm the only guy who has tools okay. in our society. I'm really the only guy that's free. Cause I'm the only guy who can make what I want to make. 
Mm. Right. All the rest of you schmucks who don't have tools, right? Yeah. You're yeah. not free. Right. And, and and since you're not productive and free, your value in terms of social relation is degraded in, uh, relative to me. Right. Do you see how that yeah, works? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and and again, it's a it's a whole materialistic view of of the human person. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. So I mean, at least it's consistent in that way. It is I consistent. Mean, that's one of the things that's fa- is fascinating about it. The technical term for tools, okay. And if you study any Marxism, you're going to come across this: are the means of production. The means of production. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And that's what Marx is like. I mean, if you were to get like a like a baseline Marxist view is that history then is really the struggle for the means of production. Yeah. And, 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 and what we're struggling over that for is not because we just have a, some addiction or fetish for tools, but because tools allow us to work and work gives us freedom and social value. Right. So whoever, whoever controls the means of production controls your social value and your freedom. That's, wow. that's good, right? Isn't <laughs> like, that neat? Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's neat in a kind of car wreck kind of way, but <laughs> you know, yeah, it, like, is, uh, it does, it does kind of have like an inner logic to it. Right. It, yeah. Yeah. It, it does. And it's, you know, but, but at the same time, it's absolutely fascinating why this is one of the most popular philosophies <laughs> that's going on right now. It's, right, yeah. Like you said, you know, it's fascinating like a car wreck. But. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, or a military disaster, you know, like you, you know, like you study like a particularly bad campaign, like say Napoleon's campaign. In Russia. <laughs> Man, this is really fascinating watching the whole Imperial army get destroyed. Uh, yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you know, but anyways. Um, <laughs> All right, folks. Well, uh, Dr. Smith, thank you. And we'll, like I said, uh, like, like uh, Dr. Smith said, we'll uh, pick this up next time and kind of okay. dive into some more of the, the elements of, of Marxism. Uh, because again, it's, uh, it's popular today and people are, are picking it up. It's important for us to, and I don't mean this in a Marxist way, it's important for us to have the tools to, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, to be able to uh, defend um, rationality and uh, mm. uh, uh, Christianity. Uh, mm-hmm. within this um and so i want to invite all the listeners in the in the meantime check out uh all of our material over at catholic studies academy.com uh and we do have a lot of things over there on uh kant um that you can kind of if you want to develop those um uh, those b- basis for those the context for uh marxism mm-hmm. we have some material over there uh with that and uh in the meantime god bless <laughs>